Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Omega Metroid Podcast. My name is Andy Spiteri, joined by the one and only Dakota Lasky. Dak, what's good? How's it going? How you doing? Not doing too bad, my friend. Not doing too bad. This is my first day off in, I want to say, like a week and a half or so. Been really busy with my my full-time job, working on the side, doing my screenwriting gig and all of that. Uh, cast Got back into actually casting uh, Collegiate Valorant. The Collegiate, uh, you know, esports season started back up again now that everyone's, well, you know, back in school, so to speak, right, remotely. So the Collegiate season's back up, so casting that again. And yeah, it's you know this is my first kind of day off in a little while, so I'm I'm looking forward to talking about some Metroid. I played in a Smash tournament today actually, and had a really sick uh, Ridley versus Ridley matchup. I actually have to show you after this. Oh nice! I, I just remembered that, but yeah, some some good stuff lately. Playing you know some Halo, some TFT. Um, got back into Sea of Thieves a little bit. Pretty cool game, and then. Um, of course, some Metroid Prime 2 in anticipation and preparation of this episode we're about to do. But otherwise, yeah, I'm doing pretty good today, man. How are you doing? Uh, I'm doing great. I'm, I'm playing a lot of uh, video games. Metroid Prime 2, of course, obviously among them. Uh, and uh, really, really great game. It, that's the Metroid Prime game. It had been the longest since I'd played. But um, yeah, doing, uh, doing pretty good. I was going to say, you know, every Friday night for the last, I think, three weeks now, me and uh, me and some buddies on my other podcast, Virtual Theater, we've been having some Smash Bros. nights. You should you should dip in and show us uh, some of your skills because we are we are all terrible. I so you could mop the floor with all of us. <laughs> I would love to. I love I love playing Smash with the homies. It's always a good time. There you go. And hey, any any listeners out there too? You you hit me up on Twitter uh, at Spateri three sixteen. We'll get some Smash going on. Um, you know what? We were we were talking before. The show started, and I just wanted to bring it up because it's it's kind of sci-fi, right? But like, yeah. So last time that we were we were talking about it, I I can't remember if you had mentioned the TV show The Expanse, and I had said that I had started watching it or that I wanted to watch it. But I have started watching it. I'm two episodes in. Very very cool so far. Yeah, great show. The, the show that I started a while ago, and I saw it when it got moved over to I think it was Amazon Prime Video. I believe when it first yeah. got moved over there. So I like binged the first three seasons. It was great. Really enjoyed it. And then, you know, I waited for the fourth season to come out. I haven't gotten to watch that yet. And then because some time has passed, I wanted to rewatch the whole thing. So I'm finishing up other shows. I'm going to rewatch it. It's a great show. Definitely recommend it for people who not only like sci-fi, but want that like itch of the multi like plot threads and, you know, large scale organizations, you know, working, to, you know, against each other and all these different factions working against each other if you're looking for a show that kind of scratches that itch with a lot of like micro and macro plot threads going on a lot of stuff happening um this is the kind of show for you it has a lot of stuff happening it's cool sci-fi and it has it's, it, has, it feels like a realistic sci-fi too right and it's it's definitely grounded yeah, yeah. in like what it would really be like so and i'm not going to give away what the show's really about because i do think you should check it out but yeah really good show especially for sci-fi fans it really kind of scratches that itch yeah, I'm I'm really liking it so far. Anything with like that kind of cyberpunk flavor to it, I'm all about. But um, maybe we shouldn't uh, maybe we shouldn't dilly dally here any longer because I feel like we're gonna go long here. We got a lot to get into. We are back with mapping Metroid. Um, anybody that was paying attention to at least my Twitter probably knew that we were uh, covering something from Metroid Prime Two Echoes and. At least to me, mm-hmm. when I think of Metroid Prime 2, I think of Sanctuary Fortress. That is the area in the game. It's it's the standout for me. It's kind of like Fendrana Drifts for the original Metroid Prime. Uh, and that is what today we are going to dive into. You know the drill of mapping Metroid. We're going to talk about the area, the music, the bosses, the items, the expansions, all of that stuff. Um, and I, I'm totally excited to get into this it had been man probably uh probably about three years or so since i had fully played metroid prime 2 and that's what i sat down and did um last week and it was a it was a great experience absolutely i mean this is still one of the best nintendo games of all time right up there with of course you know the other metroid prime games and honestly like the more i played it i was like damn is this game better than the first metroid prime like it might be and and that's what I love about these games. It's always making me reconsider and, and reevaluate. 
but also appreciate how much I love them. And I was also replaying Metroid Prime 2 for the first time in a while. I would say it's probably been around, I'd say about the same amount of time, maybe two years for me. I would, maybe I played it like 2018, I think. Mm. When I moved into my, my new apartment, I think I played all the Metroid Prime games around that time. But this was the first time that I was replaying Metroid Prime 2 with mouse and keyboard because I was playing it on Dolphin and PC. And wow, oh, so good. Oh my god, I can't gush enough about playing these games on mouse and keyboard. But going through this game as well, um, <laughs> uh, amazing. Really just opens the game up. Really fluid, really awesome. Couldn't, can't recommend it enough. And it was nice to go through this game with a nice, you know, fresh lens, so to speak, and uh, new legs after a few years. So this was, I'm really glad that we went back to this game because this is an absolutely amazing game. Might be the best game in the series and is certainly one of my favorite games of all time. Um, you know what? I want to go back to something that you said because, I mean, you know how I feel about mouse and keyboard. That, that ain't my thing. But I will say that, dear God, it... It, I almost w might have played it on mouse and keyboard because of the amount of like ridiculous chords and stuff that I needed to get out to play this game. So I had to go and plug in my Wii U, which uh, I then needed to plug in the the stupid game controller gamepad for that, that Fisher-Price toy. Mm -hmm. um, I then had to go and get uh, the Wii sensor bar and set that up. And then I had to go get my Wiimote and nunchuck and put batteries in it. Like, good God, these games, these games need to come to switch. The, the trilogy needs to come to the switch and it needs to come like yesterday because when we do future mapping Metroid segments and I want to go and freshen up and replay prime one, two or three, please Nintendo, I'm begging you. Don't make me go and get all of those cords and set up all of that hokey gimmickry equipment just just put it on the switch do what the people want put it on the switch i don't know what you're waiting for yeah so i i, I got it just i had to get that out there i definitely don't envy you man i it takes i don't know maybe two three clicks for me and i can open the game up real quick and i'm good to go so i i 100 <sighs> agree put it on the switch it's really like you know even if it's just for people who've already played the game just to make it more accessible just so yeah you don't have to drag out all your old consoles which are like retro consoles at these at this point right um yeah. to play these great games and or even if you want to play the updated version of them you got to still pull out all these old cords and consoles and all that and get everything together and over time you know those those parts and and accessories and devices there's wear and tear and you lose batteries and they get chipped they get lost they get broken or the disc you know doesn't work anymore gets scratched gets lost and you know you lose your able your ability to preserve these games right and play them as they were meant to be played or at least play them at all right so um yeah 100 percent agree they really got to release them but <clears throat> please just <clears throat> get on your pc and <clears throat> get dolphin somehow and <clears throat> play it on your pc because it's way better <laughs> don't even get it on your switch but yeah um however you can play it definitely do so because wow is it worth it this game i mean i would say all the metroid prime games age pretty decently well you know the controls at this point i think we can all agree are are the most dated aspects of the games i think but yeah you know for what they are uh, metro prime 2 is still a really excellent experience you know whether you're playing it on the original tank controls or your gamecube controller or you're playing it on the trilogy version um or obviously you know on pc mouse and keyboard yeah uh, and you know what the the actual wii controls uh, i don't think they're actually that bad it's just mm -hmm. getting to that point it's just like jesus christ i just wish that this was on the switch and you should buy it if it's on the switch even if you're a mouse and keyboard guy because, oh agreed you know we need we need those uh those copies of metroid to sell you know what i almost forgot before we get into uh sanctuary fortress here um over on the metroid database omega metroid discord uh a dude by the name of chris 06 asked us a really cool question uh he asked well first of all he asked if we ever take fan questions so here's your answer yes we do sir and he he asked if they if if that we thought that there would ever be a Metroid game without Samus or if we would entertain a Metroid game without Samus. And I actually think that we could expand a lot about that. So I'm not going to answer your question now, but uh, I I think that there is a lot of meat on that bone, and we'll definitely look at it in the future. Yeah, I think we can do a whole episode on you know a Metroid game not starring Samus. Um, mm -hmm. 
but like not necessarily in like the style of Federation Force, but like a mainline Metro game that might not star her or other you know versions as well. Um, quickly, I I'm personally open to it. I I don't need necessarily Samus to be the main character. I'm really looking for Metroid, right? Um, but I'm always open to new ideas if they can be executed well. And I think we can definitely go into a bigger episode on this. But, yeah, I'm definitely open to it. Will Nintendo do it, I think, is a different question. I don't know if they'll do it. But um, I would yeah. be open to it, yeah. And and I know that he also he, – he didn't really ask a question, but he mentioned how, like, Ridley comes back every game. That's a whole other topic. But um, no Ridley slander on my timeline. Ridley deserves to be in every Metroid <laughs> game. But, yeah, I'm, I'm open to that kind of idea. As long as it makes for a good game and it's a good character, you know, I'm definitely down for that. Always down for new ideas. Yeah, uh, all I'll say right now for that is uh, I don't think if you asked anybody in 1998 if if they wanted to see a Metal Gear Solid game without Solid Snake, they would have said yes, but we got one and it was pretty cool. So True. I, yeah, I, I'm always open. I, you know, the thing well, is, I just real quick, I think the thing with Metroid, right, is that there are still so few Metroid games. I think there's still so much that can be said, like with Samus' story that hasn't been said, right? I still think there's so much mm -hmm. of the Metroid's current story that hasn't been gone through yet that I'm still uh, work looking for more of that before we start thinking about new stories, new protagonists and all of that. I want to wrap up or at least continue what we have right now. I still think even if you don't go back to like, you know, like Academy Samus, right? Or like do a prequel. I still think in the active story, there's a lot you can do with the character, a lot you can develop and, and push the, the plot for that eventually wrap it up. So that's how I've always felt. I'm always down for new stuff, but I think, there's still so much room to do more in Metroid because there's so few games that I'd like to see that first. Yeah, yeah. Um, I agree with uh, with everything he's just said there. Um, all right, well, let's, let's get into what we're here for. Uh, we are talking Sanctuary Fortress from Metroid Prime 2 Echoes. Um, this is the last big area that you access in the game. And, um, you know, one thing that I... I knew this about Metroid Prime 2, but it's just reinforced when you play it, is like Metroid Prime 2 is very um, segmented in terms of its areas. Like within the first hour of Metroid Prime, you've probably went to all four areas in Talon, Chozo, uh, Magmore, and Fendrana. Whereas in Metroid Prime 2, you you really kind of do it like literally in, in segments where you'll hit the Temple Grounds, then you'll hit Aegon, and then you'll hit uh Torvis and then you hit Sanctuary and there's very I think there's an instance maybe one or two where you have to leave the area very quickly and go get something in another area and come back but other than that like you really explore that one area and you're kind of there for the long haul so by the time that you get to Sanctuary Fortress you're probably like pretty pretty far into your adventure maybe you're I mean you're probably like I don't know, five hours, six hours by the time you get to Sanctuary Fortress. So you're kind of like, it kind of has this anticipation that uh, that I feel really works in its favor because it's been locked behind this gate in the temple ground for like the, the entire game. You you know that there's these three areas that you have to explore, but you know, you've spent all of your adventure just, you know, locked out of this final area. So when you finally get there, um, it's a pretty big moment, and I think that that anticipation adds a little bit of mystique to the area. Uh, I don't know if I if that was just me being weird, but it it kind of works for me. No, I think you're on you're on point. You're on the right track. I I do remember once you do go to Sanctuary Fortress that I believe you do like leave a, a like one or two times and come back real quick. Like after the first time you face like the Spider Guardian, you can dip out for a bit and come back. Um, when you get like the sunburst, for example, which I believe I did. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, no, I agree. It's like that foreboding on the horizon looming over you kind of locale that you finally get to. And of course, it's such a grandiose and, and what a spectacle of an area too, that when you finally get there, like it's really satisfying when you finally step up into that cliff and, and it's all right in front of you. So yeah, no, I 100% agree with you. I love, I kind of like that about this game where it doesn't have that same like interconnected networky web kind of feel that like metroid the original metro prime does but it still has a little bit of that while i guess you know building up this last area which i think is is worth it to really put some more weight into that final you know more or less final experience in uh you know getting to the sanctuary fortress which of course is like tied to the ing hive as well so it really does have mm -hmm. like a finality to it 
And yeah, no, so I, I definitely agree with you there. I think I like that they that's the kind of like motif they went with it. It's it's good because it's different than what Metroid Prime did. And I think that Echoes needed to be a little bit different. So yeah. I, I like that they do this and like man, what a what a fantastic area. Um just what a the the moment that you walk in and you and you see this area, it's it's unlike anything in Metroid, I think. Like we've seen like ships and and stuff like that before and like but never like this like a completely synthetic environment everything is robotic and yet somehow it still feels somewhat organic in in a weird way um just like the grid lines that you see all these like crazy colors on these grid lines it it actually kind of reminds me of Tron almost where everything just has this like really stylistic approach to it but it's uh it's just breathtaking especially when you get to the sanctuary entrance which is maybe the most spectacular room in metroid prime 2 echoes i think um one you know one criticism i would have of echoes uh, up to the point that you get to sanctuary fortress is you know by its design it's kind of like a um visually it's kind of like a darker like blander game in in the sense of like it's it's more muted and the colors are a little bit yeah they don't pop as much as they did in metroid prime but man when you get to sanctuary fortress and you see like the city underneath all this all the lights from all the the, like in the background and then these these awesome grid lines going everywhere it's just like it's breathtaking it looks just phenomenal yeah you know when i first went back here right and we're i was playing it for this episode I immediately thought of how we did like the cut content and like the Metroid Prime 1.5 stuff. And I immediately thought like, you know how Metroid Prime 1.5, the whole idea is how she's on this big ship with all these AIs and stuff. And I figure like, I feel like this is what it would have been like, like a really like Sanctuary Fortress was, is like a, a smaller version maybe of what that whole game I think would have looked like and, and aesthetically kind of been like that really um, hyper like technological like uh dynamic and i wouldn't go as far as saying organic organic but yeah like that kind of style just the look of it like the lighting and all that like i immediately thought hmm, this is probably what metroid prime 1.5 would have looked like how like the all the ai and all the robotics and the ship would have gone down and i love the aesthetics of this of this uh of the whole area like yeah the grid lines like the constantly moving like spider tracks and and the lights that like really like pop out and like the outlines and edges of all these like really hard uh like geometrical shapes of the of that stick out like jut out of this cliff right it's it's i it, absolutely love it and you mentioned the city too which you know lore wise i think is so cool because Number one, it shows how absolutely immense the Luminoth society must have been, right? I mean, that city is crazy huge. Um, oh, yeah. And it looks like it's still living and going, which obviously it's, it's not. But I believe there's a scan or some kind of lore in there that mentions how, you know, that city ran on, I believe, like some kind of nuclear power and all of those reactors and all that power is still running right so it's all there like all the energy and all the the grid itself the energy grid is still running but there's no one there right they're all the the aluminum they're gone so i always loved that and as a kid i i you know i hadn't yet like grasped my my head around that so i was like oh wow like i feel like the luminos should be fine there's tons of people down there like it's all lit up <laughs> it's, mm-hmm. it must be good but obviously it's not the case but i always love that shot and you know like the rain like this like acid rain in the back i absolutely you know like some of the doors have these like rectangular like qu- columns sticking out they're like glowing red um and like tinged with like white and black it, really really cool and yeah i always thought of like metroid prime 1.5 looking at this place and i honestly think this is probably the coolest aesthetically um location not only in metroid prime 2 but one of the most throughout the entire trilogy yeah this would be up there i think for sure like just the uh, man the the code you can see like this code that kind of rises from the cityscape on the bottom and like Mm -hmm. it just adds such an atmosphere um it's I, I just I think that it's like so cool the way that at least to me like you have this entirely synthetic area but like these machines are just they're still doing their thing they're like it, it's almost like they're alive and like they are alive but it's it's just such a such an awesome area all the, like 
all of this stuff really just comes together. And, and I think it does pop, especially because, you know, you, you haven't seen anything this visually stunning in the game so far. And like you, this is completely different from anything that we saw in Metroid Prime 1. And I think that that's important because you, I mean, you could argue that the Temple Grounds, Torvis, and Aegon are, you know, they're, you're, you've seen areas that are somewhat like them in the first Metroid Prime, but you've never seen anything like Sanctuary Fortress when when you get there. And I think that you still haven't seen anything like Sanctuary Fortress since. So it's just like, it's just absolutely incredible. It's it's one of the most, uh, it's one of the most like breathtaking entrances to any area, I think, in any Metroid game. Just the, the visuals of the Sanctuary Fortress and the city underneath and oh man it's 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 incredible it's it's really awesome and and this was a no-brainer to me to to do when we were talking about metroid prime 2 so yeah uh man i I, we could probably gush about it for you know an entire episode but uh i want to get over to some of the individual rooms that are in here because i think that there is a ton of really wicked rooms and first and foremost like going past the the visual beauty of the sanctuary entrance this is another one of my like favorite rooms just like kind of schmuck around in because there's like so much to do there you can you can use your spider ball and like kind of bounce around there's also a turret in there that you can shoot stuff you use your screw attack in there um you get the uh the dark or the sky temple key in the ing high version of this it's a really involved room and i think that sanctuary fortress is like really really good at giving you these really large rooms that you can peel back more layers on every time. And I think that the entrance is like really the, the maybe the best one. Yeah. Uh, you know, honestly, overall, I would say that the whole area reminds me very much of like the Fendrana drifts, like research lab, the space pirate lab from prime one in terms of how a lot of the, the rooms are set up and built. Like, the layering, you have the cannons. A lot of the rooms are very, like, circular with, like, the layered platforms that you jump between and give you a little bit of platforming. That that always reminds me of the Space Pirate uh, Research Lab. And then this has a little bit of, like, a Skytown uh, vibe going on it, too. The the entrance yeah. area, too, with the, with the spider tracks, right? Um, yeah, I always love how it's, like, it's hanging right over, like, a huge like chasm essentially right like over the cliffside and everything's hooked up together like these big cords and cables um and like the holographed rings and whatnot yeah this is a really cool uh area and of course i think this is like right when you walk in like the space pirates kind of like laser down like warp down from the sky i believe when you first like walk into this area it's really cool Mm -hmm. yeah it is it is an incredible room um flipping over to another incredible room i think like functionally this might be maybe the best room in the game um and that is the main gyro chamber uh, first of all it's really awesome because you have that like reactor core yeah going on in the center but like it's such a classic metroid room like this this room really exemplifies what metroid does really well because like you you go in there one time and you you can do a certain objective and that's and that's fine and then you can come back later and then you can get to the higher portion of the room using your spider ball. And then you can come back a third time. And now you have the power to to break the echo gates. And you can smash through the center, uh, whatever that big, that big ball is. Uh, you can smash it and you can get your expansion. So, like, it's just, it's such a clever room that, like, it's, it's constantly has something for you to do. It constantly has something for you to come back to. And just, it, it, it's peeling back those layers. And I think that it's... It's just like a such a good example of what the Metroid series is all about and does really well. Yeah, and there's also some pretty solid lore in here too, which is just I believe there's one scan in here that talks about uh, them losing the energy transfer module. And a lot of this is like one of the first bits of lore that you get that's sla- uh, riddled and scattered all throughout the temple, which is like all of the Luminoth pretty much being sent off to die and being like mm-hmm. huge badasses <laughs> and, and writing that down before they die or whatever. And I believe there's like one scan in here where they're like, yep, like we lost, but we got to we got to keep going. We got to keep trucking and 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 fight it, fight him again. And um, but that really sucks that we took that L. And yeah, the the big nucleus, I guess you would call it in the room, 
again, that also reminded me of like I feel that's a good word. That's yeah. what I thought of. Yeah, like a little nucleus. Because I know that's I believe you get a power bomb expansion when you are able yes. to shoot it yourself into it with cannon, which was cool. But this also again made me think of like wow, this would be like in Metroid Prime one point five where like you'd be looking up at a, one of those big ai faces in the middle of the room or something that's what i thought of um but yeah this is a really sick room it reminds me of the again in the space pirate research lab from prime one like that big room with the like the the planetarium room right where you have the big yeah yeah, yeah. the big galaxy hologram like kind of gives you that same similar vibe right there yeah totally uh i do i <laughs> i do want to say it took me an embarrassing amount of time to remember that, you know, when you stop the second uh, platform that's that's floating around the nucleus and it's kind of like diagonal. Uh, it took me just an embarrassing amount of time to remember like, oh, yeah, you got a spider ball and then boost off of that to break the glass. I was power bombing. I I think I went to the other end of Sanctuary Fortress and I was like, just get I almost looked up a walkthrough, actually. And then I got mm-hmm. back there and like slapped my forehead. But uh, again, I feel like that's uh I feel like that's a strength of Metroid is like the, the answer is just so obvious, but kind of hidden in a nice way. Um, another really great room is the main research room. And I know that I'm kind of going through the greatest hits of Sanctuary Fortress here, but like, I, I feel like, again, these are, these are the greatest hits for a reason. There's so much to do in this room. Um, it, first of all, it looks super cool and it has a really cool mini boss battle, which we'll cover in a little bit. But again, there's like there's tons of echo gates you can you can use your your visor uh, to your advantage in this room. Um, lots of again more like spider ball tracks. Uh, just like, and it just like again it just looks really cool. Like almost every room in Sanctuary Fortress looks really cool. Let's be honest. But I really like the uh, basically any room where you have to use the echo visor. I I'm really all about. And uh, when you get a power up for doing so, I'm all about. And yeah, this this one just stuck out to me just because like I just thought it was really cool how like you kind of rise and rise and rise and rise and you know eventually you get the the caretaker and uh, and get to the staging area. But yeah, this one visually I think is cool, and I'm just kind of a sucker for those um, spider ball track platform sections. Yeah, it's one of those classic Metroid Prime rooms where you step into it the first time and it's pretty unassuming, but you know you're gonna be able to do a lot more with it later when you come back and. Yeah, there's mm-hmm. that like weird like I don't the the laser drill boss in the like like the second or third time you come back to this room that you fight, and of course it has a bunch of those uh, what do they call them the uh, quad mates M eights the quad M eights that are walking around which I yeah forgot that's what they were called so when I scanned them for the first time again there was like quad mate because the? <laughs> they're called quad M eights like a quad mate. Um, but they're like guardians from Breath of the Wild, kind of. How they like look and walk around, just like waiting to mess something up. <laughs> and that's like the first thing I thought of when I walked into them again. Pretty interesting enemies, though they can be kind of annoying. But yeah, that's a pretty cool room. I think it's I think it stood out the most to me because of the the drill battle later that you end up in against it. Yeah, um, I never. You know what? I, now that you said it, I could see that about how the the drill or the yeah the the drones are the quad drones are kind of like guardians um so yeah i could see that all right i'm gonna I, so i love almost every room in sanctuary fortress but i do want to point out one room that i like screamed at my television at because it was so ridiculous you, you know the room that the screw attack is in and it's hidden behind that um that contraption and you have to, to turn all of the four pillars or whatever to unlock it I think so, that, yeah. That room, I was, like, so fed up playing it because there is, like... So there's these platforms that you have to jump to, but there are um, res bits on every single platform. And we'll talk about these little guys when we when we cover enemies in just a bit here. But the, there is one res bit for every single platform, and they just shoot mm-hmm. and shoot and shoot. I must have fell off here, like, probably 25 times. And... Uh, I, oh man, I was just like, I was ready to throw my Wii mode at the TV by the end of it, and, because I was trying to do it fast and not take out the individual res bits, which in the end really slowed me down because they uh, they kept <laughs> shooting me off the cliff. But yeah, that room, I was just like shaking my fist, and, and when I finally got the screw attack, I was like, 
I'm never, ever coming back here. I don't care if there's a power-up I missed. See you later. So <laughs> this is probably just me being a bad player, but I thought I would just point it out. I hate Resbits, man. Those things oh. are so annoying. And I know there uh, there's a bunch of them when you first go to the watch station area, which I think might be around near where you're talking about. I like that. That's one of my favorite rooms, in, which I guess it's not really a room. It's like an outdoor area, but whatever. Um that's like where there's like a cannon and there's a bunch of these like the spinning um, spider tracks on like discs kind of. And you get this like mm-hmm. wide wall shot of the, the outside like exterior of the temple. Oh, such a cool area. I, it's not a crazy hard room or anything. There's a couple tracks. There's, I believe, some flying pirates that show up the second time you go into the room. And but but it just looks so cool. And I always love like the tilting and turning. um the spider tracks like on those discs always look so cool to me, but you know, the different glowing, like the, the red and, and like scion against the gray, like dark gray, black of the temple and like the, or the sanctuary fortress just looks so cool. And the watch station, definitely a favorite of mine. Cause it has some really cool, creative spider tracks. And this, this area certainly loves to use its spider tracks. There's all, they're all over the place. So, yes. uh, makes good use of them. I'm a sucker for that too. Um, when we talk about expansions later, almost all of my favorite expansions to collect in here involve spider tracks and, and boosting because I just think it's like such a fun mechanic. Uh, so Agreed. yeah, I, I'm all about that. Yeah. Um, all right. Let's uh, let's talk about the music of Sanctuary Fortress. And and I told you before we had started recording that I have the, the theme stuck mm-hmm. in my head and I've had it stuck in my head all day, but what a! I, I think that the music matched the scene, and I think that it was very important that it needed to. This sounds so unlike anything else that we've heard in Metroid at that point. Um, it wasn't a remix of anything, which I think is important. It was his own kind of theme, and it just like it sounds. I, I don't know. It sounds like synthetic to me, but it, there was also that kind of like like almost like church sounding chanting in the background. Um, but then you have that crazy whistly techy synth. That's that it sounds like it's just going bonkers when it's playing, but it's actually quite melodic. It's such a impactful theme. And it's really like, I, I think that it was really important that they nailed the music to match the visuals of this, you know, crazy synthetic area. And I think that they really did that. I would put this one up there with like, Maybe not, maybe not as iconic to me as Fendrana, but like I, I think that this is for sure the best piece of music in Echoes. What about what say you? This is definitely like a, a Metroid fans like favorite, right? Like it might not be the Fendrana drifts or whatever, but I mean, if if you know, if you know, you know, like this is a, such a good track, and you're right, yeah, it has like the the choir, like the choir, like the chanting and the synths that Metroid Prime is known for, but it has some really good percussion too. And that's what I love about what a lot of the music in Metroid Prime 2 does is that it it, it captures, I would say, like 75, 80, maybe 85 percent of like what Metroid Prime sounds like, but like just adds a little bit of a twist. So it's familiar, but new. And I love that even then, like before you get to this area, the Temple Grounds area also has such an amazing track too. I, that one I, I love maybe even more, but they both have some really solid percussion like tracks and channels in the back there that give it that little bit of a twist a little bit of like a booming kind of weight to it um it gives a little more of a punch right and it's not so it is melodic but it still gives like it reminds you that there's some stakes and some urgency here too and i always Mm -hmm. love that about the track it's really really good i agree uh probably the best track in in the whole game if not one of the best obviously a top five maybe in a top three we're going to debate it, but yeah, they hit the nail on the head with this one. Such a good track. I mean, no surprise, almost every track in like the Metro Prime trilogy is really good. So yeah, yeah, you'd be hard pressed to find a bad one in there, but uh, this one really goes above and beyond. Um, also, th- so there is another, like a remix of this that plays in the, in the lower section of Sanctuary Fortress. And this one this one is also really cool, but it doesn't have like that crazy whistling synth going on. Mm-hmm. So that's removed, but it the bass line is much more pronounced and it's much more, um, it's got like this lower pitch synth going for it. 
So it doesn't have that same kind of... Because I think that the whistling synth kind of catches your attention on the main Sanctuary track. This one doesn't have that. And it just has some like almost subtle, like, I don't know, kind of ominous uh, synths going on in the background. It actually, this is going to be a deep cut, but it kind of reminded me of the music that plays in Fight Club when um, the narrator is running through these abandoned buildings at the end of the movie. Uh, it gave me kind of similar vibes to that. And uh, I, I don't know that I ever realized like how much I really liked this track. And it's obviously not as, to use Fendrana as an example again, it's not as different as like Fendrana's Edge is from uh, the main theme. But this one I think is also almost just as good. It's it's really kind of, it's got that sinister bass line to it, which I really dig. Yeah, I honestly for a second thought you were going to say, it just made me realize how much I love the movie Fight Club. <laughs> I mean, I do love the movie Fight Club. I'm, I ain't going to lie to you. I uh, That's the see. I haven't played Metroid Prime 2 in a while, but if there's one movie I haven't seen in a while, it's Fight Club. So, by the way, um, if, just really quickly, I don't know if you've seen the new movie Soul, that new Pixar movie. Wow. Really good movie. Really recommend it. Really amazing animation. I, I heard it was really, really good. Really good. Yeah. yeah, very, very, very good. Sorry, I just wanted to jump that in there because I, I don't... I try not to force feed movie recommendations on people. Everyone likes different stuff, but I think you should check it out. Now, also, Sanctuary Fortress is really sick too, and I agree. <laughs> and I agree. <laughs> um, don't don't know that any of the other music was like like it was all good. Nothing really stuck out to me. The dark like the dark uh, Aether themes usually kind of don't stick out to me. They're they're much more muted. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, actually, I, I thought that the Spider Guardian boss fight sound was yeah. uh, was pretty cool. It was simple, but it, it's nice. It, it got your heart pounding. Got you feeling something other yeah, than, you, you know. Go. I think the music in here is just really good. Yeah. No, I agree 100%. Um, well, I guess speaking of uh, Mr. Spider Guardian here, let's just jump right into the bosses, and we might as well start with the Spider Guardian. This is... Um, this might be one of my favorite fights in the game. What? I and really, <laughs> I, I'm I'm not kidding. Yeah, it's oh my God. first of all, it's it's really fun because it's different than anything else that you do. I really like the morph ball puzzle segments and like those those kind of areas and like the puzzles that you do in them. Um, I thought that it was fun, like trying to quickly get uh, all the all like the little bomb spots to to open up so he could go and, and zap himself it's just like it's so it's so unique that i i really appreciated it and uh yeah i i don't know it's just like it's really it really stood out to me and i i think that it might be yeah it, it's probably up there with my favorite boss battles of the game like it's not like it's overly complicated but it requires you to act fast it requires you to be precise with your jumps and your bombs and i i like that you know, I will uh, respectfully disagree. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know what? I, I feel like I'm in the minority there, so don't worry. You know, I will... I will. Um, what's the right word? Maybe not applaud, but I appreciate and respect that they tried to do something different with these, like, these, these bosses, right? Like, you have the Boost Guardian, the Spider Guardian, all of that. And, yeah, they are different. They require a different skill set sure um but i i always hated this boss <laughs> i always like no i never liked it i always felt it was so tedious it's one of those things when you're playing a game where you try something and, like you're like oh come on come on like you're, you keep like missing the the right shot or like getting the the bomb in the right place at the right time and just like requires so much trial and error sometimes and and it's also like that one like flat shot. I mean, you do go to those other like the different structures and whatnot, and that's kind of cool. But yeah, this is definitely not one of my favorite boss battles. I, I'll I'll stick to my big giant enemy monsters. Thank you very much. Instead of like termites in the wall that I'm f messing around with, like let's let's let's. I don't know. I, I've always hated the guardian bosses in this game. I like that they tried to do something different. I don't think their horrendous bosses are really that bad at all um they're okay but they always i was i always found them tedious as hell and couldn't wait for them to be over and was happy that i got the spider guardian or the spider ball out of that uh creepy little thing's clutches and into mine so yeah um 
different, but mm, not my and probably my least easily my least favorite boss in the area out of like the three. Oh man, easily, okay. oh, easily, easily. Uh, okay, okay. Um, I'm I'm gonna say that I think that Dark Samus is my least favorite boss oh, I like of one. this area. There's so I mean there's we've talked about this before where there is the law of diminishing returns and I think that you probably fight Dark Samus too many times in this game and this fight in particular is very 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 similar to the first fight and I, I don't know something about like I think that the setting for this fight is very cool when you're going up like the elevator and then you're at the top of Sanctuary Fortress it looks very very cool but it's kind of missing the how do I even say this? Like the first fight has this like close quarters kind of brawl feel to it to me. And like there's stuff blowing up everywhere and it feels like just a drag down fight, which I thought was very cool. Um, and there's nothing wrong with this fight. It's, it's fine. It's just like, I think it's just the law of diminishing returns for me where I'm like, okay, this is kind of like the, the fight that we did before. And then I know that we have to do this again later in the game. So it's like, okay, let's just get this over with. Um, it doesn't help that, like, Dark Samus is so annoying to hit. Like, he, she just zip-zaps around everywhere, so it, it's tough to hit her. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know. It's This isn't a bad fight, I don't think, but it's probably my least favorite one. Although the theme, of course, obviously rocks. Oh, yeah, it does. I definitely was, I was about to say, you gotta at least appreciate the good music. Oh, yeah, yeah, for sure. So I don't remember where I put this fight in our uh, boss fight rankings list, and I will I'll always note that any one of those ranking like episodes, I could definitely change my mind on, you know, on a dime on any of those opinions. So going back to this boss fight, I I would mostly agree. Yeah, I do think it has a bit of diminishing returns. I still thought it was a pretty cool boss fight for what it is. I like um, yeah. Samus is you know gets in your face like flying right at you, and she's boosting around which. You know, it does make for a hard target, but I thought it was fun. I try and chase her down, and she's flying into the air and shooting shots off at you. You got to throw on your dark visor at times. She's boost balling around, which, you know, are kind of just filler moments. But I like the moments where she's flying at you or flying into the air and taking long-range shots. Um, yeah, I, w- I would say it's a, a pretty pretty good battle. Not, uh, uh, you know... Mm. I don't know. Maybe it is my. It's hard because I I kind of have some faults with like the Quadraxis fight as well. But I think this fight is pretty good, and I like the the elevator like shot up, and then you're at the top of the tower, and or you know whatever, and with the rain in the back, it looks really cool. And then you know she has to like do her like overly dramatic like evil laugh, and then has to like fall off the cliff and <laughs> like all dramatically into like the abyss. So yeah, this one might. I don't know if it's my favorite of the whole area. It might be just because I don't know. I think dark Samus fights overall, even if they are diminishing returns are still pretty consistently decent to good. Um, yeah, I think this is a pretty good boss fight. I think it's way better than the spider guardian. That's for sure. So um, yeah, I think this is a pretty cool fight uh, for what it is. Yeah. Um, well, I mean the main event, the big one of sanctuary fortress is of course, Quadraxis, and uh, this is like this is a fight that I think is both good and bad. And this is very much to me like one of those. So there's a couple different types of boss fights. One of them is just like a, a straight up fight, and then there's other ones that are like almost like a puzzle type of boss fight where you have to do certain objectives, and once you do them, then you can inflict a large portion of damage on the boss at once. And I think that for the most part, Quadraxis falls into the latter. Um, which, which isn't like terrible, but at, at times it's just like, okay. Um, I think that, so there's three main phases to this boss fight. And I think that the third one is really, really fun where you have to, again, uh, spider boost off and, and latch onto the stunned head mm-hmm. of Quadraxis. Uh, the first phase is also pretty fun where you have to boost ball and take out his legs. The second phase I feel like is just drags and drags and drags um it requires using your echo visor to basically uh damage the 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 echo sonar whatever is going to quadraxis and while you're doing this there's a ton of the quad enemies that are you know you have to deal with um that that one to me 
that phase really kind of grinds the momentum of this boss fight. I think if it were just like the the first and the third boss fight, this would be really high up there for me. But mm. um, with the second one, it's kind of a mixed bag. Although Quadraxis himself obviously looks, you know, super, super cool. You know, actually, now that I'm looking over my notes and thinking about it more, I do think this is probably my favorite um, boss battle overall. And, <clears throat> or from this area, that is. <clears throat> First, mm-hmm. I definitely think Quadrax is a cool idea, like this big monster, like this monster Hulk, Hulk, wow, this monstrous hulking, like, robot just hanging out in this arena, a bunch of, like, ink juice comes up, corrupts it, you gotta fight it. Um, <laughs> first phase kind of reminds me, like, you're fighting, like, Thardis or, like, a Scarab from Halo, right? Like, yeah, you're trying to, you get under the feet to try and lay bombs, but then you're also shooting the joints out and whatnot. I think that's a pretty cool phase. And then the third phase, right, yeah, you're fighting against, like, the head portion, like, the floating head module, and you're, I, I love, like, the, the the shooting off onto the head, blowing yeah. up bombs in the brain. Um, I think the second phase is okay. I feel like the fight might have actually felt a bit too short if it didn't have that second phase. I think they wanted to make the fight feel, like, really big and, and, and grandiose and have this larger scale than the other two fights, right? Which I think they accomplished by having that second phase because... It does, like, drag it a little longer, but it makes things a little tougher, and I think that fight's pretty good, and I like the having to switch over to the Echo Visor and taking out, like, the radio, radio signals or whatever's going on with that, um, which I didn't find too cumbersome or anything. I, I'm, I've always been a fan of, like, the Visor Switches mid-boss battle to give you uh, what little semblance of strategy there is in Metroid games. Uh, any kind of hint towards that or nod to that, uh, I like. And not that I would even consider really changing visors or strategy more so or anything, but um, makes things feel dynamic. I, I like this fight. I think it's cool. I think it's. I, I kind of wish he was almost a little more intense, a little cra- a little harder at times, especially the first phase. I wish was a little more intense. But I've I, you know I think Quadraxis has always been like the, the standout boss, one of the standout bosses for Metroid Prime Two, certainly from this area is the sp- standout boss and is a really solid end cap to the whole. Um, big mechanical every droids out to kill you uh, area right where you have one more big ma- machine to take out before you get a couple of things and head out so yeah I, th- I think this is a cool fight I-, I would I would actually have to pick this one over the dark samus fight I think this one's my favorite hmm yeah I I don't know if I would pick this one over the spider guardian to be honest um I don't know because I yeah I, I think that the Maybe if they'd have made the first phase and the third phase, or the, yeah, the first phase and the third phase tougher, like maybe if you needed to do, uh, if you needed to bomb the head four times instead of two, and just cut out the second part, that would be okay. I, like, I do like that they implemented the Echo Visor, I, I like that, you know, you're using your tools, but the way, the way that they did it, I don't know if it, like, I don't know if it was a home run for me, but that, that's okay, it's still... It's still a cool boss, and it is definitely a spectacle, is a good word that you use, um, to, to end off Sanctuary Fortress on. So, yeah, it's uh, it's definitely one of the most memorable bosses of the game anyways, just on a visual level. So I, I can appreciate it for that. Um, let's, uh, let's keep it going here, and let's talk about some of the enemies that you encounter in this place. And I want to start off and kind of go back to what I was saying at the very beginning. Not necessarily an enemy, but like a creature that you can scan in here that I just like absolutely love is the Serenity Drone. And when I say that like it almost feels organic, even though it's synthetic to me, this is a good example of, of how that makes me feel because it's like it's like this creature, this robot, but it's just living in this this ecosystem and it's doing what it's supposed to do. It's not it's not like interacting with anything, but it's just constantly fixing and repairing the the fortress and i just think that that's like so so cool it's almost beautiful in a way that like this this thing is just there alive but doing its duty but i I don't know i i I really love them they really stand out to me and they really i think they they elevate sanctuary fortress and make it feel alive it would have been really easy for this to feel like a really cold um sterile like mechanical place and i think that all the little drones that you see working in the background really help it feel like alive and, and breathing almost in in its own way. You're giving a lot of credit to what are essentially Roombas. <laughs> um, That's how I feel when I see a Roomba cleaning someone's carpet I, is 
this this is alive. This. They are cute. You know, no, I agree because it, it it plays that idea of like something like feeling alive, but it not being alive, right? Like, and it goes back to like the city down there, which is looks very much alive. Looks like you know hundreds of millions of people down there living, but it's not. Like, it's completely empty. But at the energy and the things that run the city are still working and are still running. And that's what I like about this is that clearly this the the fortress had a use for when the Luminoth were alive, but all those systems and and resources and energy are still there without anyone to you know use them or take care of them. So they're just running and doing what they've been programmed to do. And it's certainly a theme and a motif that isn't you know wholly original to sci-fi, but it's certainly a welcome one. It's a cool trope when applied, and certainly Metroid I think does that really well as having like that that constant theme throughout all the metroid games of old things left behind that are still working that are reflections of things that are left behind or used to be there right and mm-hmm. this is of course one of those things where you know the luminoth had this big sag, you know this big fortress and they needed all these robots to not only protect them but to maintain it right and these drones which are essentially just uh like the the prime like skittering bugs that they have too, like those little critters that don't really do much and kind of just explode on your visor. They're essentially the same thing, but um, mm-hmm. yeah, they they do kind of add to that motif of it's not alive, but it is living. Everything is still r- running rather than living, right? And it's kind of a, a look into what things used to be like and aren't anymore. But yeah, they're pretty cool. I I, I, I would blast them up every time. <laughs> you see them on the wall, I would destroy them all. But yeah, they're cool. Oh man, <laughs> I couldn't do it. I I would feel too no, bad. I had to squash I never them. Oh, them. Had to like they'd just be these just flush columns. Like ooh, <laughs> lined up for you, boy. Had to. All right, let me tell you about who I did have to squash. Resbits. We talked about them earlier. Mm. The first time, so it had been three years, okay, since I played Echoes. The first time I saw a Resbit again, I was like, man, what a great looking enemy. This is, they're so cool. They have this like code, like flying around them. They can disrupt your your visor system if they, if they hit you. This is a really cool and unique enemy. And I thought that the first time that I saw it right at the entrance of Sanctuary. And then, as I gradually ran into Resbits at every single intersection, almost, in Sanctuary Fortress, I was gradually like, I hate Resbits. Mm-hmm. These things are the worst. Because you can't target them once they go into their crazy spin-out mode where they lose their code shield or whatever the hell that thing is. You have to you have to aim and just hit them, and that's fine. And it takes, like four or five, maybe even six charged beam shots in order to get rid of them. Um, they they stick around for way too long. Even if you hit them with a super missile, you still have to fire off one more charged shot to get rid of them. These little bastards were everywhere. They're always shooting a million missiles at you. They're the worst. I I think you've uh <laughs> you've kind of taken all the words out of my out of my mouth, right? I mean they are super <laughs> super annoying. Uh, they were designed entirely to be annoying. They look really cool though. They I don't, they look cool. I don't know how to really describe them. They're the like data geomorphic like patterns with these like balls floating around. Uh, I, I I don't know. I don't know really. Whoever was whatever like whoever designed these, I want to know what they're on because um, they're they're something, but. They're annoying because you kind of you can use like uh, the dark beam and then missiles. Uh, you can use like a power bomb to get rid of them, but it's not always very convenient to do that. And sometimes you gotta like stop what you're doing and be like, "All right, I gotta take these guys out." And I I think they're cool to look at, but yeah, super 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 annoying. And I'm trying to think of what they remind me of, like the original Metroid Prime. But yeah, I I really wish I would never have to see another one of these ever again. Oh man, and you might as well lump uh, quads in there too. These are these are also everywhere. They're like a dirty shirt. You can't get rid of them. Um, they're inc- they're incredibly annoying because there is a right way to fight them and there is a wrong way to fight them. And if you do it the wrong way, where you take out the the legs first and then you have to fight the head, mm-hmm. good God, it takes forever. It takes like two or three super missiles to blow up that head. But if you take out the head first and then just roll into the legs, I find that that's far easier. But yeah, these, these guys are 
they're everywhere and they're just oh they're they're so repetitive is a good word for them yeah these are like the guardian guys the quads um i always thought their spinning attack was silly looking (laughs) but otherwise i actually i like fighting these things they're kind of these slower fights and they're uh you know walking around sentry and and yeah you have a way to like kill them the right way or you you get into a more prolonged fight and there are a couple of rooms i don't i don't remember which rooms exactly but there's like one or two rooms in the in this area that there's a bunch of them all in one area there's like half a dozen yeah. or something like that and you're dealing with all of them at once and trying to like uh morph ball around them all and i always like that like they're always constantly scanning for you and have that kind of guardian feel i like these enemies and added added bonus fun for the one of their modules being called the quad mate because that just makes me laugh every time so i th- i want to say that's the body module not the head module um oh i'm sorry it's mb that's what it see when i was playing the game i got it i got it, i got it so the the body version is quad mb and the head is quad cm i thought it was quad m8 that's why i was saying quad mate and i'm sure you're probably sitting there like what is he talking about but that's what i was talking about i was i thought the b was an eight i like these that's en- okay. i like these enemies man regardless they're my mates regardless of what you call them i think they're cool they're they're known as the quad mates <laughs> on omega metroid yeah. from here on in uh let's talk about the incredibly named ing smasher I lo- oh yeah, I love this yeah. dude's name. <laughs> um, you know what? It it doesn't happen too 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 often, but there are times when you're playing Echoes and you you really notice like, oh, that's they they reused this asset from Metroid Prime, and like you, this is one of the enemies that is like very apparent. Like this is a reskinned um, Elite Pirate from Metroid Prime. It's like the exact same thing. Uh, but you know what? I think that's okay. I think that these are still pretty cool. They're they're easier to fight than elite pirates. Um, and yeah, I I think that they they're used sparingly, and it's always pretty intimidating when one of these when one of these guys busts out of the wall, and then the intense music starts. So I'm down for that. I like him. Well, you know, I mean, one of the great things about Metroid Prime Two is that it it really is a game that had like a rush development, a lot of reused stuff. I mean, so much of this game is reused from the original Metroid Prime, and yet it feels so much different. And that's, like, kind of what I was hinting at earlier when, like, a lot of this area feels like they kind of, like, took a lot of the rooms from the Space Pirate Lab and, and redid them. And then, yeah, enemies, reskinned enemies. I mean, I think one of my favorites is the, you know, the the Triclops, right, from um, Magmore Caverns in the original Metroid. Mm-hmm. Like, they're in this area called Mechclops, and they're just the exact same enemy, but they're, like, grayish-colored now. So, I'm like, okay, guys. But, um, yeah, the Ink Smasher, this is an enemy that I distinctly remember the first time I played Metroid Prime 2. The first room you go into, like that antechamber, like one of the earliest rooms in the the area that you walk into, and there's a couple of these, and nothing happens. And I think at first I um, thought that they were going to be like some kind of golem that you would control. Um, or like, you know, like where the head is, I thought like maybe your morph ball would go in. Cause it has like this ball motif going on with like the ball hands and the ballish head and like the circular eye, like the circular shoulders and all that. I was a hundred percent convinced that there would be some kind of like morph ball apparatus or something that you could use with these things. Um, anyway, and then you finally fight them and I was like, Oh yes, let's go. And they're, they're interesting fight. Cause like they charge at you with the balls you got to shoot. Um, and you can like kind of freeze them a little bit. So yeah, the, oh, the, the hall of combat is where they are. Um, yeah, these are essentially like uh, elite pirates with ball hands. <laughs> it's a, it's, it's a weird, a uh, very weird, better for smashing ing, I guess. I guess. Yeah. Like what, ma- <laughs> that's how they got their name. Yeah. I don't know what makes them ing <laughs> smashers or why, like they would want to have these balls permanently melded to their hands instead of having actual regular hands like why not create a robot that has hands and then can pick up these balls and hold them if if needed i don't know um I, i'll 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 give the luminoth right like they were they didn't mess around they'll fight to their last breath they'll you know die in cold blood and they'll create these like really weird like battle droids or whatever but um i appreciate the interesting design i thought fighting these things are a bit slow but overall pretty cool because they do kind of get close to you and, and uh, they, they're pretty mm-hmm. big 
yeah, a bit slow, a bit but slow. I, I appreciate that they don't take like a million super missiles to mm-hmm. uh, to kill. I think maybe three super missiles and maybe a charge shot or two, and, and they're usually done. Um, all right, last enemy that I wanted to talk about. I don't know if you have any that you do, but I really love the uh, the caretaker drone, and that's like uh, maybe the, maybe this should have been in the boss category, but it's not necessarily a boss. Maybe a mini boss, but he's the drone that you fight in main research as you're going up, and you have to to boost ball and hit the portion in the center while avoiding all of its lasers. I, like I said, I'm just like a sucker for spider ball boost ball combos. Like, I just think it's so fun. So, you know that I loved this. Um, it's a really, it's a really cool fight. And again, it's different, which I appreciate and incorporates Samus's, uh, morph ball a little bit more into the boss fights, which I also appreciate. So I, I'm really, this is high up there for me in, in terms of both like enemies and in terms of like, I don't know, a quasi boss fight. So I, I, this guy really sticks out to me. I think the, the enemy that I would say is like my honorable mention are the, the octopedes. If you remember like the little ball, like chain of like balls. Oh yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I don't know. I just like, they're cool. They're just cool little dudes that like move around and you shoot one and it. They all like fall apart and roll around and explode and whatnot they're not a hard enemy or anything and i'm not even sure like what exactly like why they would be made like apparently they're supposed to be like patrolling century like security drones but i really like they're i guess they would be a threat to normal organic matter right like not samus walking around but they're not like very particularly strong or anything so they're kind of just like Mm -hmm. a nuisance if that but um that's why I think they're so funny because I'm like I don't understand how this would keep anyone safe or what they're doing that like cameras can't do, and yet they're they're around a good amount of the area and they're pretty funny to fight and I always just like why does this exist? But another one of those like why do this exist? Metroid enemies that I think are kind of cool to look at and, and fun to shoot at. You know, and no matter what, no matter how far away you are, these the little balls once you shoot them always just seem to land right in front of your face and blow up yeah (laughs) so (laughs) that's a that's a good talent to have um you know we've been kind of touching about some of the the different lore that you that you can find in the area here and uh i i do think that there's um a couple things that that do stick out to me that i i thought were cool uh, the first thing that I thought was pretty neat, and you can kind of see it and make your assumption when you see the giant city, but the the Sanctuary Fortress is like, you know, the, you find out that it's basically the first settlement that the Luminoth um, made when they got to Aether, and they that's when the Golden Age of the planet kind of started. And that makes a lot of sense, because you see all the lights, you can infer that like most of the Luminoth actually do live there. Um, it makes the most sense that they would probably live there, because the other areas that you see in the game are a bog and a wasteland. So um, I, I do like that. And I think that it's, you know, pretty cool that you can kind of trace back where the Luminoth actually originated from. Yeah. I think one thing that I, not gripe, but one thing that was always a stickler for me from the original Metroid prime is that the Chozo were obviously there, but it didn't look like lived in. It looked like they were there, right. And worked there and excavated and, and did like stuff and colonized right town four, but you never found like an area where like, Oh, the Chozo could have like, this is where the Chozo slept. And like, this is where like cultural things, you know, like maybe the Chozo ruins like mm-hmm. outer lobby area, right. That could be kind of like a main plaza for a, a Chozo kind of town. But I never really felt like, Oh, the Chozo could have lived here literally right even though they obviously did somehow but we never really get a taste of that and this is like the first place where the 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 fortress itself isn't like you would say lived in but certainly obviously could house like luminoth soldiers and whatnot but then obviously the city right there shows that like there's a huge sprawling um metropolis and i think metro it's like a hyper metropolis almost how big it is Mm -hmm. um you know show that there was more to this like society than just okay fighting the ing and the, and the soldiers and all of that but there you know there was a whole culture a whole civilization of just you know normal you know probably luminoth who had nothing to do with any of that stuff and that i think was always really cool giving you that kind of you know scope and context to it and even if you don't even think of it that far just seeing that like how big of a city they could build right i mean that's bigger than i think any other that's like bigger than some 
or rivals like Galactic Federation cities, it looks like, right? Like, I don't think we've seen anything mm. of that scale that the Chozo have ever built, right? So to see that in kind of contrast, the Chozo are like, you know, nomadic and, you know, spread thin, right? And then in comparison, the Luminoth, who like aesthetically and technologically might seem similar to the Chozo, you can see in this respect are very, very different. And I like that kind of nuance that this uh, brings to the table. Yeah, I, I thought that it was um, pretty cool. And another thing that I thought was kind of cool, too, and uh, I believe that there is a scan or two. I can't remember where it was now that I'm trying to think of it, but there there is a scan that kind of indicates that Sanctuary Fortress actually didn't really fall all that long before the events of the game take place. And that probably doesn't seem like a big deal, but like to me, I appreciated it because I'm like, okay, well, like, it's a fortress, right? So you would think that this is going to be their last stand, and when you're scanning all of the Ing, uh, or the Luminoth, rather, you you do learn that, like, this is where all the Luminoth did, in fact, make their last stand, and it's only recently fallen, and it's lucky yeah. that Samus shows up when she does, because, you know, once once their they're kind of Helm's Deep, if you were, has fallen, um, it probably wouldn't have been long until the Ing just completely overwhelmed him. So I, I kind of appreciated that little detail that they give you. Right. Um, I mean, the the bodies are, are still there. Like, they still got flesh on them, right? It couldn't have been that long. And, I you know, this is another one of those things that I don't think I've ever gotten down pat from the Metroid series. And that's uh, the, the passage of time and, like, how time is told, right? So we know, like, cycles are used as a form of measurement. And I want to say there's one scan in here where one of the Luminoth that died at the temp or at the the fortress, um, you you see the scan and it says terminated 1.1 decacycles ago. Mm-hmm. So I don't know. I always thought a cycle was a year, but I don't think that's the case. I want a cycle could have been like a day, right? Like or a week, in which case maybe a decacycle is only a you know, a 10 day span or, you know, a couple month span or something like that. I think it honestly might be days and I'm sure someone in the comments will, will correct me, but, um, de- you know, 1.1 decacycles makes me feel like, okay, it was what, like 11 days ago, which maybe seems too short or too soon. But I mean, those bodies seem, I mean, they're right there. Like those bodies are kind of fresh almost like they're, they're, they're still skin on the bones and whatnot, right? Like they haven't been there for mad long. It's like they're skeletons. So it couldn't have been that long ago. Um, yeah, but yeah, yeah. It's definitely where like, okay, like that's, that's, that's pretty much right where, uh, everything kind of went down and that was kind of their last stand for sure. Uh, yeah. And like you, you kind of infer that like once they lost the, uh, the sanctuary, that's when they were like, okay, we need to go into uh, stasis or whatever it is that all the Luminoth go into until somebody comes and, and saves our bacon. So yeah, I, I, I kind of appreciated that. And I think that it's, um, a cool little touch. Mm. Um, let's, let's talk about some of the items and the expansions that you get in here. Of course, the big ones, uh, that you find are the spider ball, which you get from the spider guardian and the echo visor, which, uh, you know, you get from dark Samus. And I really do love the, uh, the echo visor. I think that it's like such a wicked idea. Um, it's too bad that like you really only use it in sanctuary there's not really much use for it outside there's a couple places here and there but i guess like it doesn't really make sense for the rest of the game to have echo locks or egg sonar doors or anything like that so i can uh, i can appreciate that but it is uh it is too bad that it's it's kind of limited in the uh the way that you use the echo visor yeah uh i you know i always felt the dark visor and the echo visor kind of were not really stacked on top of each other in terms of like, you know, feature a bit like their usability. Cause they do do different stuff. I always liked how the echo visor looked though. Um, Oh, it looks awesome. It looks so sick. And obviously you need it for like the echo gates and like fighting Quadrax's head. Um, and I want to say you get the echo visor after you fight dark Samus, if I remember correctly. And yes. I think one of the cool things you learn through a bunch of getting these items in the fortress, by the way, is that like they all I think they were either all made or owned by like one particular Luminoth. So like you're getting that like kind of passed down from it from them. Um, they all kind of use this technology against thing as well, which I think is really cool. The, the dark mm-hmm. visor overall 
is a pretty interesting visor, right? Like it kind of just shows the difference between light and dark and all that. But the Echo visor kind of expands on that a little more. And obviously has this really, really like sick, like uncolorized, like I don't even know how to really just describe it technically look to it. Um, but yeah, I, I, I thought the Echo visor, the Echo visor obviously I think stands out the, the most, I, I would say out of all these newer ones, maybe the, I think you got the annihilator beam here too. Um, yeah, you do. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So maybe the annihilator beam sticks out a little bit more, but I always thought the echo visor does, uh, just cause it's such a weird, uh, pickup, right? I don't know. I, I, it's a cool, I, I like that they, they did that with these visors. They really tried to play on like the dark light motif and, and the echo visor does feel distinct enough from the dark visor. Yeah, and uh, you you mentioned earlier that there is a particular Luminoth that, you know, it's said that this was their technology. Mm -hmm. Um, A-Cull. A-Cull, yes. uh, K-U-L is is the one that allegedly had the dark visor, the dark suit, the annihilator beam, and uh, it doesn't say the echo visor, but he, that's where the annihilator beam came Mm. from. So that's, that's very cool. I think that um, this is a conversation for another episode, but I, I hate that. Prime 2 uses um, ammunition. It, it makes me less incentivized to use the other beams, but um, you you do... The Annihilator beam is, like, incredibly, incredibly useful, particularly in the Ing Hive, where you can just draw all of the dark enemies to the portal, like the light portals, and they just basically kill themselves in front of you. So I, I really do like this pickup. Um, we've kind of talked about the Annihilator beam before on our beam episode, so I won't spend too much time going over it here, but uh, it is, uh, it, it's a pretty solid pickup and, um, you know, works pretty much in tandem with the echo visor for the most part. Dude, it's called the annihilator beam, man. How badass is that? Um, yeah, this is like the, the a the champion of aether, a weapon, right? Like this is his, his B and B. It even looks really cool when you pick it up and it, it's, I guess like the plasma beam of the game, um, yeah, this is I I always love this one because it also gives you like the the full the, like the charge disruptor and then you have the sonic boom combo. But um, yeah, the the annihilator beam is is cool though. You, it doesn't open certain kinds of hatches, which is kind of annoying. <laughs> um, this is like a, a weapon you pretty much want to use for like the Emperor Ink fight because it's not actually so. I guess, from my understanding, the Annihilator Beam is not actually as strong against dark and light enemies as the individual dark and light beams are, right? Um, so mm-hmm. it, you, it's really best used for the Emperoring fight because it, it's uh, viable in all the different phases of the boss fight. So, um, which is which is cool tactically, I guess. Um, I actually I didn't really know that until I did a little more research. Um, not most recently, but like when I was a kid, I didn't know like that difference when i grew up later i I figured found that out um but i always i mean it's the annihilator beam man i mean it looks so dope and <laughs> so cool it's such a sick name it's it looks really cool when it's charging i'll give it that yes uh and, and we could we could talk more about the beams and, and metroid prime 2's choice to use ammunition on a later episode but uh, let's move on and let's talk about some of the expansions that you can get in here i know we're running long but i want to get these in here before we uh before we dip out of here like I said, I love, I love, love, love the uh, all of like the boost ball and the spider ball sections in here. Mm-hmm. Um, the con- the Hall of Combat Mastery has a really fun uh, expansion that you can get. Uh, I think it's just a missile expansion, and you need to jump and you need to bomb jump and spider ball on the inside tracks of the wall. Uh, it's it's not overly complicated, but I just like I think that that kind of stuff is really fun and. Um, when I was when I was playing Metroid Prime Three not that long ago, I forgot that you can tilt your Wiimote upwards and the ball jumps, and so I did not forget that this time. And it made pretty much every segment where you have to do uh, morph ball stuff way 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 more enjoyable. So I like this one. Oh yeah, I, I can imagine. I always I thought the the boosting from like one track to another was always really cool. Um. I actually didn't even know that <laughs> about the, the, the trilogy version, by the way. <laughs> so that's news to me. Well, hey, the, the more you know, and for all of you other players out there playing on your old ass Wiimotes, uh, tilt it up and you will jump. It's, it's a lifesaver. Hmm. Um, 
a really cool uh speaking of another really cool power up is uh in the reactor core where you use your your spider ball and you're like you're boosting off your there's these like little balls in the room that like are spider balls they look really funky and they have like the little pads so you know where to boost off of um you you do a couple boosts and then you get all the way to the top and you and you finally get to the spider ball and you uh or the spider track and you can roll down and get an energy tank and that one was really satisfying to me because it's like it's one of those ones that you can see in plain sight and you can hear the buzzing of it but like you can't access it right away Mm -hmm. so finally getting those is always like like very satisfying to me Oh yeah, you know I I know exactly what you're talking about. I I still think the most satisfying thing to me was still when you're in the, like the the drill, kind of fight and you're doing the spider tracks there and then you have to jump from one side to the other, right? I think that one was pretty good. Mm. Um, but and then I know we mentioned this earlier, but I still think the most satisfying usage of the spider ball is when you like flip, do like the 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 Hot Wheels half loop onto uh, Quadrax's head to bomb on him still i really think that's a such a such a cool way to implement that but yeah there's so many there are a lot of good uses i think honestly like the 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 whole area makes a really good use of both the the boost ball bomb jump um you know trying to get you a little more creative with the spider ball as much as you can yeah yeah and and actually you mentioned it earlier but i'm going to mention it again just kind of speaking of satisfying pickups um, the power bomb expansion inside the gyro chamber mm-hmm. where you finally, finally have all the tools that you need to open the stupid echo gate at the bottom and you can just like uh, roll into a morph ball and cannon shoots you right through the, the nucleus. Um, it's it's not that it's hard to do. It's just that it took you so long. Like you're you're completely done Sanctuary Fortress by the time that you can finally go back and get this. And like you've scanned the, the reactor and it tells you like, hey, you can break this, but... It just takes forever. When you finally get it, it's just, it, it's very it's a satisfying feeling. Yeah, this is definitely one that I was like, all right, I'll do this later. And then, because I'll admit, I, I actually I looked up a guide here and there for this area. Um, just because I didn't want to take it like too long. And I were a couple of things I forgot. I wanted to pick up a couple of the expansions. And this was one of them because I mm-hmm. ended up forgetting about it. And then... I was like, oh, yeah, you can shoot yourself through this. Now you have everything. And I was like on my way out. And I was like, oh, yeah, 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 let me do this. And destroyed that nucleus. And that was very satisfying. Um, glad I was able to get that. But, you know, again, that's like one of those great things that Metroid does, right? It, it teases you with uh, something you know you can get, can't get until later. And then you finally do get it. You're like, yeah. yes, haha, got you. Um, perfect example of that. It, this this was like the power up. And, and every Metroid fan is going to know what I'm talking about here. But... The one that you're just like, oh, can I get this now? Can I get this now? I, I have to be able to get this now with my new pickup. Right. And like you just keep coming back and you're like, God damn it, I still can't get this stupid thing. This was this was that one for me where it's like, even though it's just a, a stupid power bomb expansion that really doesn't even matter by the time that you get it, it's just like, okay, th- this is fine. I've got it now. I can finally move on. Mm-hmm. Um, the last thing that I thought was uh was kind of neat, I guess. And mostly just because I like the room, but um, the Sky Temple key that you get in the Hive Fortress at the entrance, where you have to uh, make use of your light suit and your screw attack, uh, I, I I like that. I don't particularly think that the screw attack is very good in Metroid Prime Two, but um, at least there is like a area where it kind of makes sense to have this elongated jump. So that that one sticks out to me too. I'll give it a shout out. Yeah, Prime Two it will always have that kind of footnote right the asterisk of like it's not really a screw attack it's kind of like a i I like a a, it's more of a space jump it's like yeah it's like a modified space jump right it is limited in that way but i think it's understandable you know considering that there really hadn't been a good way to at all yet of implementing the screw attack into 3d space and then you know technology back then it might not have been as easy and then yeah you got to make areas that it works for right I mean, you know, when yeah. you're playing a 2D Metroid and you get to the, you know, the portion of the game where you have a screw attack and the f- the floor doesn't exist anymore. You know, when you have the screw attack at the spaceship at the same time, like you just abuse the whole area. And I think they wanted to avoid that with a, a huge 3D space is giving you something like the actual screw attack. That would have been just, I mean, it would have broke the game, right? So they had to really limit it. And I do, I really hope that they kind of figure out what they're, you know, how to work it in a 3d space and i would love to see it implemented in like a true fashion in metroid prime 4 and it seems like there's kind of they tried to play around with it in here 
And certainly it was pro it was definitely something in the game because we even know like the speed booster was something that they they considered right at one point like the speed booster the screw attack these are kinds of abilities that in 2D implementation really don't require I think too much but you know in 3D require so much more and like they only had so much development time I think they probably would have spent so much time just trying to get those those things uh, working correctly right that. It's no wonder that like mm -hmm. the speed booster didn't make it in and the screw attack is as limited as it is. But that being said, I, I do like that it gets implemented here a little bit. It's pretty cool, though. I think it kind of slows the pace of the game down a little bit because of how limited it is. And it is you know, a straight shot every time. You, you, know, you can only really use it in certain places, and that's it. Um, and the game pretty much tells you when to do it. <laughs> so it doesn't really make you, let you get that creative with it either. Um, but, you know, maybe one day we get a really full-fleshed, you know, fully fledged out, um, you know, well-executed screw attack. This is uh, definitely a topic for another day, but I have an idea mm. about how you could do the screw attack in a 3D space. Maybe we'll maybe we'll just do kind of a hodgepodge Q&A episode or something and we can get to that. But uh, for now, we should wrap things up because we are going just stupid long here. Dak, any final thoughts on Sanctuary Fortress before uh, we get out of here? Hmm... You know, I I think this is, like, along those lines of, if you go back to, like, some of the Metroid, like, Metro Prime 1.5 and Prime 2 concept work, and even some of, like, the Prime 3 concept art, where it looked like Retro wanted to go in, like, a, like a more abstract kind of, uh, you know, approach to things. And I think Sanctuary Fortress, even though it is still along the lines of, like, the usual sci-fi, like, technological look of things... It it goes in a way like in a, in a in a direction that I think really takes it away from how Metroid usually looks a lot of the time, and uh, at the same time still being a very familiar level because it does you know take a lot from previous like you know from Metroid Prime and and has a bunch of familiar you know enemies and and power ups and whatnot, but is a really really awesome standout area with some solid lore, a great aesthetics, awesome music, some cool power ups. And over across the board, on average, pretty decent to good boss battles. So, I mean, this has to be one of the overall most consistent areas in all of Metroid, certainly in the Metroid Prime trilogy. One of my favorites. Looks really cool, a lot of fun, and is a great, you know, part of the game. So, yeah, I'm really glad we went back and revisited this. And I'm, I think all of y'all should, if you listen to this episode, go back and, and take a stop. Take a trip down to the Sanctuary Fortress and see how those those quads are doing absolutely um but don't don't stay too long and visit the res bits yeah maybe uh, they they're not worth it yeah uh, man what what an area unlike anything that we've seen in metroid uh before or since mm -hmm. i don't think i think that's fair to say so it's just a just a standout area for all the reasons that you listed um and really just such a such a unique experience and and for like the sci-fi nerd in me i just really love that kind of that synthetic yet mm -hmm. organic thing that I still don't think I've explained properly how it, that makes me feel, but that's okay. <laughs> I just, I really love it. It's uh, for all the reasons that you said, maybe one of the best areas, if not, if not in the running for the best in the entire Metroid prime trilogy. So I can't put it over enough. And I am glad that uh, we went back and covered sanctuary fortress and uh, wow. What, uh, what an episode I, I think that we had on it. Um, uh, we are we are definitely going long, so we're going to get out of here. But uh, we are going to be back next week, and uh, I, I do believe that we're delving back into the world of Metroid theories. So uh, that that's going to be fun, and I'm looking forward to that. Uh, for now, of course, we want you guys to check us out over on Twitter at Omega Metroid Pod, at Spateri316, and at Dak City underscore. Uh, and of course, we want you to check us out wherever you get your podcasts, uh, Apple Pods, Spotify, you name it, you go there, subscribe and give us a five star review too. If you think that we've earned it, that would be very cool. Uh, that is it. That is all until next week, everybody take care. <laughs>